Yeah, let's dive into God's Word. We are in Acts chapter number 8 again, so if you have your Bible, you can uh, go there. Um, I'm sure we've all heard of the term, the sacred and secular divide. Sacred and secular divide. Have we all heard of that? Would somebody care to define that for us this morning? What does it mean when you hear the sacred and secular divide? Volunteer, one, two, three. Okay, there's one there at the back. Somebody wants to volunteer. If you could speak into the microphone. What makes me think of the difference between the spirit and the flesh. So sacred is spirit, secular is flesh. Okay, that's good. Somebody else want to expand, elaborate? Where does it come from? Somebody's at the back there. Uh, okay, then come back here. Somebody at the front here. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think more to add from that. It just made me think of that when people are like separation of church and state, right? To say the yes. church shouldn't be involved in the state's state. affairs and the state shouldn't be involved in the church's affairs. So we should keep them separate. separate. Okay. I think we're good, right? I think the, the, that's a, those are two good definitions of what the secular and sacred divide means. So that divide is made, um, basically it says that what is holy should not uh, be mixed in with what is not holy. The problem in our lives is that when we live our lives based on the sacred and secular divide is that we begin to partition or compartment, compartmentalize our lives. And so what we say is that there are certain areas where God should be included, and then in certain other areas of our lives, God should not be included. And so this is how this plays out. For many Christians, they end up having a Sunday life where God is firmly engaged and involved in that life. You know, and because we're good Christians, we have an outfit to wear on Sundays. No, that's my outfit for Sunday because I'm going to worship God. But then the rest of my week, from Monday to Saturday, there is no involvement from God. And I have my own set of friends that go with that life. You know, and uh, for those of you who like these things, I've got the hot pants and the muscle top to go, in, to go with that too. So Sunday has God and his friends, but the rest of my life has God and the attire to go with it. And so this says to us that on some days I can act godly, because I am enjoying or partaking in the sacred, and other days I don't have to because now I am in the secular realm. In a recent study in the United States amongst millennials, and I know many of you are millennials in this room, it was found that in order not to offend their friends, their friends of another faith or friends of no faith, millennials are willing to compromise on their Christian faith. In other words, if I am talking to somebody who's not a Christian about something that I have an opinion on based on how I live as a Christian, I will not give them my opinion. But they also said that they will not share the gospel with those who are not believers because they don't want to offend them. And so in the millennial Christian's mind, it's, in the US, it's a U.S. study, this is what they say. When I'm at church, I should worship God and enjoy that. But when I'm out with my other friends who don't worship God, actually, let's just leave them alone. Let's let them be. And as I said, it's an American study, but I believe and I've begun to see uh, traces of this in South Africa as well. Is that we are willing to compromise on our faith when we are out in the world. But if we say that our faith has meaning, if we say that our faith has meaning and it makes a difference in our lives, then we should not be living our lives on the sacred and secular divide. Because our faith needs to penetrate and affect every facet of our existence. In today's lesson, we will see that our lives need to have a, our lives need to have a seamless integration between the sacred and the secular. If I was to put this another way, I would say that as a Christian, you shouldn't have one way you behave at church and then you behave another way when you're out there in the world. Your life should be the same. 
So we are in the book of Acts, and we're going to look at a character by the name of Philip. Last time we looked at Simon the sorcerer. This morning we're going to look at the man who preached salvation to Simon. So as we know, at the outset of Pentecost, in Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit came down. The church began to experience a lot of growth, but then with that growth, we started to see persecution come towards the church. And that culminated in the killing of Ustivovo. And with Stephen's killing, many Christians escaped from Jerusalem. Many Christians escaped from Jerusalem, excluding the apostles. They were hoping to seek safe pasture elsewhere. And Philip was one of those who left Jerusalem in order to be safe. So we first come across Philip in Acts chapter number 6 when he's appointed as a deacon in the church. Remember there was a, a squabble in the church and the elders or the apostles said, hey, we don't have time to be waiting on tables. Appoint men that you trust. Appoint men of good character who are filled with the Spirit, who are wise, and let them handle this little problem we have. Philip was one of these. So if we're to use today's terms, we'd say Philip was somebody in middle management. His job was to do what the directors have instructed. And this middle manager goes and does something incredible. But I know us, because we buy business magazines, we watch Forbes, we always want to hear about the directors, the movers and shakers, right? So somebody's asking themselves, why are we looking at the life of a middle manager? They go nowhere. Why aren't we looking at the apostles? The reason we're going to look at the life of Philip this morning is because we most identify with Philip. And the contribution he makes is a contribution that we too can also make in our society, in our day and age. But to truly understand or to see the significance of what Philip does, we need to go back to Acts chapter number 8. And Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as we said, the church was growing in leaps and bounds. Scripture says to us, thousands were added to the church daily. They found favor amongst the people daily. But somehow there was no mission work that was happening outside Jerusalem. And this was in contravention to what Jesus said. He said what? The gospel will go out into Judea and Samaria. But this only begins to happen when persecution comes to the church. All along, they were happy to preach and grow in Jerusalem until persecution forced them out of the city. Here's a question which I'm hoping that one of you will be able to answer. Why did it take persecution for the church to begin to preach the gospel outside Jerusalem? Why did it take persecution for the gospel to arrive in Samaria? Somebody interested in answering that? Where's our microphone? Just lift your hand up if you are confident. Even if you're not confident, Somebody will come to you. The only thing I can think of is that they were comfortable where they were at. The church was comfortable. That's good. Uh, I think one can make an inference from the verse that you have there because uh, obviously Jesus Christ himself went through persecution. Um, as disciples of uh, Christ, they would also have to go through persecution to be inspired uh, to spread this gospel because they're being persecuted for it. So persecution was inevitable. Okay. One more person. Give a stab. All those answers are correct. The rest of you are looking down. It's don't choose me. <laughs> it's like in school. Yes, it's true, the church was comfortable like many of us are comfortable. 
And so when you're comfortable, you don't want to push the boundaries, right? As uh, one um, meme is going around these days, hey, we're just cruising. We're just cruising. Comfort. But then persecution was inevitable because Jesus was persecuted. The other answer I was looking for, and this is, you'd find this if you're familiar with the Gospels. You would know that the Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other. But listen to what Jesus says. He says what? Can you go back to uh, Acts 1 and 8? In all Judea, which, which Jerusalem and Judea, it's all Jews there, and Samaria. Jesus was specific. But Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. I love what one author says about this. He says, the Samaritans were a people whom the Jews cordially hated and regarded as heretical. The feeling of hostility was, however, mutual. So to that end, Jews and Samaritans avoided each other. And I mean, so we arrive in the scene and the two people groups hate each other, but it's two people groups who live right next to each other. Why do they hate each other? Well, in order to understand that, we have to jump all the way back to the Old Testament. And history tells us that when the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away, it was attacked by Syria and taken away into exile, some of the Israelites or Jews were left behind. Probably those who were not educated, probably those who were poor, were left behind in the area. 2 Kings 17 tells us that after the king of Syria had taken the brightest and best out of Israel, he sent other nations to go and live there. Other nations from other parts of the Assyrian Empire. And so the people who arrived in northern Israel at this time brought with them their own idols and their own religion. And in time, these new people groups and the Israelites intermarried and they were now called Samaritans. That's where it comes from. But then because they were a new people, they also took some parts of their idol worship and Judaism and they mixed it into one. And they had a, a new religion. And then they decided to worship God on Mount Gerizim, which was away from Jerusalem. And so they had their own place to worship. They had their own religion. And they were a new group of people. And so Jews, when they came back in the southern kingdom, the land of Judah, they began to call the Samaritans half-breeds. You guys aren't pure. You've intermarried, you've mixed. God said you shouldn't do that. And worse off, you've chosen a religion that's opposed to God. Probably the most famous Samaritan that we all know is the guy that Jesus talks about in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And second to him would be the lady that Jesus meets in the Gospel of John, chapter number four. The terse exchange that she has with Jesus sums up the relationship that Samaritans had with the Jews. Nevertheless, Jesus, being who he was, went about preaching in the Samaritan towns. He preached, he healed those people. But Jesus' attitude towards the Samaritans didn't rub off on the disciples. Because in Luke chapter number 9, if you would go home and read that, you will see that after a Samaritan town had rejected Jesus, James and John come to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, should we let fire rain down from heaven and kill these people? And of course, Jesus rebukes them. I tell you all of this to say that it would not be mistaken of us to say that the reason the disciples didn't go out and preach the gospel in Samaria is because of prejudice. Yes, it was comfortable, but based on what we see in the text, we know that that attitude was like, yeah, Jesus, we know you said we should go there, but you know that those are half-breeds. So at some point, because the Holy Spirit is at work, we'll get there but just not now. It was not their priority. But God. 
God uses the discomfort of persecution to drive out the gospel, and he chooses to use this guy by the name of Philip, the manager. I find it ironic when I read Acts 8 because earlier on in chapter number 6, it was the apostles who said, hey, deacons, you take care of the tables. We will do the work of preaching and teaching. But somehow in chapter 7 and 8, you find managers doing the work that the apostles were meant to be doing. Because it would make sense to us for God to use the big apostles, but God tends to use people who are available. God uses people who are available, and through them, he shakes things up. We've already seen Stephen. Now a second one, Philip, is at work. If you don't take anything from this sermon, take this one thing. God is not a respecter of persons. God uses whomever is available for his purpose and his glory. And maybe Philip, in comparison to the apostles, thought that he was not qualified. But because Jesus had changed his life so drastically, wherever he went, he couldn't help but tell people about this same Jesus. God uses whomever is available. But what does Philip's story have to do with the Definition that we gave earlier, the definition of the sacred and secular. You see, the truth is that some of us wrestle with how we ought to live our lives outside the confines of church. We know how we ought to behave at church because we've been saved by Jesus Christ. We've embraced this new way of life. Yet at the same time, we are professionals in a world that does not care about Jesus. So how do we integrate the fact that we really believe in Jesus and are called to tell the world about Jesus and the fact that I am employed as a project manager and not as a preacher of the gospel? How do I integrate that life? Because so many Christians struggle to be able to do both. That's why we said it tends to be lives that are one thing on Sunday and another thing from Monday to Saturday. I bet that if some of your colleagues were to hear that you are a serious Christian, they'd fall off their chairs. Because they'd be like, Wena, Wena, Umuzalwane, Wena, ah, get out of here. But here in the passage of Luke 8, Philip shows that it's not impossible to be a manager and to be used of God all at the same time. For those of you who were at part of Every Nation, I'm sure you've heard of this. The work of sharing the gospel is not just for those who are in full-time ministry. All of us are called to ministry full-time. So to that end, I want us to pick up some observations from the life of Philip. And these observations will help us be effective carriers of the gospel even in the places where we're not primarily called to be ministers. I've got four points, three points rather. Number one, God qualifies and gives us strengths. God qualifies and gives us strengths. By the time that Philip lands in Samaria, he's been identified as somebody who is full of wisdom, has good character, and is filled with the Holy Spirit. And God says that's all that he needed to evangelize the Samaritans. You see, oftentimes we think that I need some deep theological background in order to, to tell my colleagues, what if they ask me a question I can't answer? This was not Philip's preoccupation. See, God qualifies those whom he calls. And if he has given you his Holy Spirit, you are qualified to tell others about him. In other words, if you are saved, you have the potential to tell other people about God. But not only that, God also gives us strengths. God wants to use you just as you are. 
God doesn't save us and then change us to be like somebody else. No, God saves you and he says, as you are, I want you to reach the world with your personality, with the traits, with the strengths I have given you. We've just spoken of the animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Well, Philip's greatest asset or strength was that he was not a Hebraic Jew. He was a Hellenistic Jew. He grew up in a more cosmopolitan culture. So as he went to Samaria, he didn't have any of the cultural hang-ups that the other Jews had. He didn't treat these people as half-breeds. These were just people to him. So when he gets there, he begins to do that which Jesus had commanded, preach the gospel, because what he was seeing in front of him were people who were in need of a savior. Not half-breeds who first needed to convert to Judaism and then come to Jesus. Whether you know this or not, there are some spaces as your pastor that I cannot reach. I can't. I can't reach your office. I can't reach your friendship circles because I'm not exposed to them. I can just imagine myself walking down waterfall. Not the mall, but that business complex. There are all those businesses. And I stop at one of those companies and I go to security guard. I'm here to see someone. They'll be like, do you have an appointment? No. I just want to see somebody. Why? I think people need to hear about Jesus. Would you let me in? I just want to share the gospel. Maybe pray for somebody who's in need of prayer. I can see the security guard saying to me, Numzan, do you have an appointment? No, I just want to come in and pray. They'll be like, Agnam Tandazullah, Gailu Hamdi. That's what they say. However, you are in those offices, you are in those boardrooms, you are the one who's at Tasha's next to fancy people. You, like Philip, have no barrier to the people who need Jesus. We could see that Philip was already serving people who had physical needs. That's his track record. He's proven as somebody who works hard. And when he gets to Samaria, he realizes that the need here is not physical, it is spiritual. And so Philip could take the work that he did in meeting physical needs and the spiritual work all in a day's, all in, all in a day's work. He could do that. For the people you work with, the greatest need is not money for a meal that day. Their greatest need is not a place to sleep tonight. But they have a need for some spiritual connection. They're beset by depression, anxiety, debt. Maybe relationships are tearing apart. That is your Samaria. And God has put you there for a reason. And because you are there and he's empowered you by his spirit and he's given you strengths, he says, work. Work. I know what some of you are thinking run about now. You're like, hey, Pastor T, should I be the Bible basher in my office? The guy who's always preaching. The guy who's always saying this. The guy who's always rebuking people. Not at all. Not at all. A little while ago, I saw a message on LinkedIn. Somebody wrote about, somebody wrote about someone here at True North Church. Now, I don't know if the person who wrote on your LinkedIn page knows that you're a Christian. But what I did see is that you are a good boss. I know that you're a good boss because of what they wrote about you. Now, I would like to think it's the fruit of the Spirit working in you such that one of your juniors says, my boss is so good. I want to write for the whole world to see. And yeah, we might say, that's a, a small thing. 
But you never know what life might bring. Perhaps the way that you engage with your junior might bring about a gospel opportunity sometime down the line. When they ask you, hey man, why are you so different and you got nothing to say but it's Jesus. And when I read that, I said to myself, in a world full of complaints, because all of us think our bosses are dumb and horrible, right? Yeah, I, I can see, yeah? For somebody to go out of their way to write good things about their boss, that's a mark that can never be erased. So God empowers you by his spirit, but he also uses your strengths. For some of us, child of God, and I don't say this lightly, it is being reliable and dependable in your job. That's a gospel witness. Because scripture says what? Do everything for the glory of God. And I'm not talking about just doing the minimum of eight to five. But the kind of person who, as you do your job, people see something special about you. Your attitude. The way you speak to people. Let's go back to our text. You see, in Philip going to Samaria and preaching to the people there, he doesn't just spark a revival But the attitude of the apostles changes towards these people. Peter and John are called to come to Samaria so they can pray for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to to be set on these people. And then we're told that after Peter and John leave Samaria, they go about to many Samaritan towns preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the boldness of this manager changes the whole trajectory, not just of the Samaritans, but of Jews as well. What it says that the church of Jesus Christ was not separated. It was now whole with people from diverse backgrounds. Right there, he breaks the divide between what was holy and not holy. And here's the remarkable thing, is that in your places of work, you have more in common with those who are around you than Philip had with the Samaritans. You have more in common with those around you than Philip had with the Samaritans. Maybe it's because you went to the same school, or you do the same after work activities, but God has put you there, and you can Use that commonality to share the goodness of the gospel. Let's go to our second point. God speaks and directs us. And so Jesus, before he leaves, he says, I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit so he will lead and guide you into all all truth. And that's what we see in Acts 8. I'm I'm reading from verse 26. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem, that goes down to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. It's kind of like a minister of finance. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, And as a lamb is silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth. 33. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe describe his generation? For his life is taken 
from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about? Himself or someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. So Philip is in Samaria, and there's a great revival happening. People are being healed, people are being delivered, the Holy Spirit is coming down, things are going well. And then God through an angel says to him, get up, go. The language in the text literally says, go to a, a desolate place. Go to a place where no one else wants to be. This is what the Spirit of God says to him. Leave the revival and go somewhere else. I can only wonder what Philip was thinking because he knew that strip of the Gaza Road. And I'm sure he's thinking, but God, some things are great are happening here, but you want me to go there when no one actually goes? Nevertheless, Philip follows the instructions. See, sometimes when God speaks to us, sometimes when, sometimes when God is leading us, we get confused because it doesn't make sense. But Philip understood that when God speaks to, us, to him, when God speaks to us, it is part of his providential plan. And so it gets more interesting because not only is Philip pulled from a revival he is pulled to meet one person. Think about it. He was with thousands. But God calls him to meet one person. Friends, we never know what obedience to God unlocks in people's lives. And what that obedience, that single obedience, does for many generations to come. Philip was called to talk to one person. And I know that when you read the story, people are going to say, well, God will never send down an angel for me so that I can talk to my colleague. No, he won't, not necessarily. But what's important is that we follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to the Ethiopian official, we spend some time a few weeks from now just kind of talking about the significance of that message. But the question I have for you this morning is that could it be that God is leading you to certain people in your life? God is directing you and saying, I want you to talk to this person. And you're thinking, but God, they seem to have their life all figured out. They are so together. Nothing is missing. Nothing is broken in their lives. But God's saying, yes, that person. Because I am God and I know why I need you to talk to them. Just as a, a by the way, think about it. Philip is walking on foot. This Ethiopian guy is in a chariot. What am I going to offer this guy? The scroll of Isaiah that he was reading was one of the most expensive scrolls to purchase at that time in the world. And this guy had one for his personal use. So he was obviously wealthy. And Philip could have disqualified himself and said, ah, but God, this guy's in a chariot. This guy's wealthy. What do I have to say to him? And maybe some of you think exactly like Philip when God says, talk to certain people. But God, I know how much they earned last year. It's a few million. Really, God? Look at that house, God. Look at that car. Look at that Instagram life. God is speaking. So God says, I want to talk to you about the family in your complex, the team at work, or the struggling single parent. And here's the great thing about it. God calls him to go to that road in the desert, but then even when he gets there, he still, still says to him, go up the chariot. God will give you the words to speak. He will give you the words to speak. You need to be available. You need to be willing to listen to the Spirit's prompting. But finally, God has the long game in mind. You see, I believe that the reason most Christians don't want to talk about Jesus to their colleagues 
is because, number one, you don't want to hear the nasty remarks about you. Stuff like, ah, oh, there goes a the judgmental one. That's obvious. But I think the bigger reason is this. You are afraid that after you've told other people about Jesus, you are going to mess up at some time in your life. So you're like, to save myself the embarrassment, let me not say anything at all. What happens if I get a divorce? What happens if I lose my job, but I've told everybody about Jesus, hey, you know, hey, you know, this is me. So we choose not to tell people. Let me free you of that. As human beings, we'll make mistakes. Mistakes are a part of life. So you need to be free from that. And making mistakes is part of your faith journey. But remember what we said last time. You need to get up. Because see, the story of Philip doesn't just end with the eunuch. We catch up with Philip about 20 years later in Acts 21. In verse 7, it says, this is Luke writing as he travels with Paul. When we completed our voyage from Tyre, we reached Timelius, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. The next day, we left and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. The fact that Philip was married and had kids tells me he wasn't perfect. He was not a perfect man. Because I'm sure he'd gotten into an argument with his wife or shouted at his, at his children. He was just a normal guy like you and me. However, what we see in the text is that this man remained faithful. He made consistent in his love for Jesus and for people. He's called Philip the Evangelist, which means he was still doing the same thing that he was doing 20 years before. But so what God is looking for is consistency over perfection. Consistency over perfection. God has not called you to be perfect. We grow in perfection, but we're not called to be perfect. We are called to be consistent, which, as somebody said, he said, it is long obedience in the same direction. That no matter what happens in your life, good or bad, that you would stay or remain consistent. Here's the truth. Life throws curveballs at us. And as I said, something tragic might happen in your life. A relationship might come apart. That should not make you Think, oh, let me not tell others about Jesus. What God wants to see is that despite those things happening, you will be steadfast in your faith. Can your colleagues see you through sickness and everything still trusting in the same Jesus you told them about? Philip's story, had it ended in Acts 8, you'd be like, hey, this great guy, revival guy. But because God has a long-term plan in mind, we see him 20 years later, far removed from the revival, but he's raising kids who believe in God. Showing a man who's steady. He is steady. The fact that his daughters are mentioned, I've said this so many times before, that in ancient times, the women weren't mentioned. But Luke took the time to mention his four daughters, and he says what? They had the gift of prophecy, which means they believed in the same Jesus that their father believed in. That he wasn't just some guy who was telling stories about, you know, 20 years ago, I was having a revival. 20 years ago, people were healed. No, no. He was able to tell his kids about the God who changed his life and who continues to be at work. Philip was the real deal, and your people and the people around us are looking just for that. The real deal. So as I said earlier, absolve yourself from the idea that you have to be perfect to tell other people about Jesus. People will take you seriously when despite the problems of life come your way, 
you can still be a believer. That despite the issues you might have, yes, you, are still able to say, you know what? I still believe in Jesus and I'm going to tell you about him. This is what people are looking for, the real deal. Why? Because we live in a culture where fads are new every day. And people want to know, do you stick to something real? Do you stand firm? In this passage, the gospel of Jesus Christ flourishes in the midst of persecution. It flourishes because a simple manager didn't resign himself to his daily job. He didn't say, all I'm good for is just doing the job of looking after the widows. He said, I can do more because Jesus has changed my life. And so he made himself available to be used of God. So the question this morning is that, are you willing to make yourself available to be used of God? Because God has given you his spirit. God has given you strengths that he can use for his glory. God says he will direct and he will lead you. But finally, God is not looking for a quick fix. He wants you to be real with those around you. Live life with them. Let your life be a testimony. But the question remains, are you available to be used of God? Are you willing to live your life integrated? Not having the sacred and the secular, but saying, God, use all of me in every facet of my life to your glory.